Hey everybody, in this next video lesson, we're gonna talk about the different cell potentials and how they relate to Gibbs free energy, or free energy delta G. We talked about a little bit how these voltaic cells discharge their electricity with a positive voltage spontaneously. And so now we're gonna be able to connect that to free energy. We're also going to be able to connect the concept of cell potential to equilibrium constant. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about what happens in a non-standard situation when a voltaic cell is set up where the conditions are not standard, where you have not one molar solutions in your half cells of the voltaic cell. First, let's take a look at this first slide. EMF and free energy. Now, EMF stands for electromotive force, which is just basically saying the same thing as cell potential. Electromotive force is kind of a physics term, but we don't really talk about electromotive force too much in chemistry. Well, we know that anything that has a negative delta G from last chapter is spontaneous. We call that thermodynamically favorable. We also know that anything with a positive cell potential is spontaneous, which means it's also thermodynamically favorable. So if both of these are considered thermodynamically favorable, then there must be something that connects them, some way to calculate if you know one, you know the other. And here's the formula. It's on your formula sheet. It is delta G standard is equal to negative N F E standard. Now what each of these letters mean, well, of course we know delta G is free energy, but N stands for moles of electrons transferred. F is known as Faraday's constant, which is defined as 96,485 coulombs of energy per mole. A coulomb is basically a measure of electric charge. Finally, cell potential here at the end. So if you know the number of moles transferred and Faraday's constant and the cell potential, you can calculate the delta G of the voltaic cell. Chances are if the cell potential is positive, then delta G is definitely going to be negative. If the cell potential is negative, it's a non-spontaneous situation, but it's possible. But then, of course, delta G would be positive, because as we defined spontaneity, delta G is positive. Voltaic cells are never at equilibrium. When they start out, they're at standard conditions, one molar, and that is never going to be at equilibrium with the other half cell. And so these are going to run spontaneously towards equilibrium. Once the cell potential reaches zero, then the reaction is at equilibrium. And if the cell potential is zero, according to this formula, then the free energy is also zero, which again, in the last chapter we established, means that the reaction is at equilibrium. At this point, we know that free energy can be related to the cell potential with the formula delta G equal to negative NFE. And as of last chapter, we know free energy is related to the equilibrium constant by the formula negative RT natural log of K. So why can't we just put these two together? So that we can relate cell potential and equilibrium constant. So in order to do this, we're gonna solve these two equations for each other. And we'll put negative NFE on this side, and we'll put negative RT natural log of K on this side, and then we'll use basic algebra to solve for the cell potential by dividing by negative one on each side to get rid of the negative signs, and then also dividing by nf on each side. So in the end, we have cell potential is equal to rt over nf times the natural log of k. Now we have a formula that relates the equilibrium constant and the cell potential. Now this formula is not found on your formula sheet, but the two on the top are, so you could easily substitute them in and set them equal to each other and solve either for cell potential, if you have K, or you could solve for K if you have the cell potential. If we wanted to solve for the equilibrium constant and we knew the cell potential, well then we can just rearrange this formula so that we isolate K. In that case, K would equal e to the e times n times f over rt power. Lowercase e here is the inverse of natural log. And then the exponent is just all of these things together. 
the cell potential times the number of moles times Faraday's constant divided by the R divided by T. Remember, R has to be in joules, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And if you have those, you can t easily solve for K if you have all the rest of the numbers. This is a picture from our textbook, and it kind of nicely shows the triangular shape of all these different things that you can solve for one another. Delta G can be solved for cell potential using this formula, or delta G can be solved for equilibrium constant using fit this formula, or you can do equilibrium and cell potential using the formula that we just outlined on the last slide. A reminder that we have this one and this one on our formula sheet, but we don't have this one across the bottom. But if you just set these two equal to each other and solve, then you can generate this one. And so make sure that you have those and know how to use them and where to find them on your formula sheet so that you can use them on the AP test. Let's take a look at some practice problems that involve the calculating of K and cell potential and delta G. So take a look at this problem. You've got four atoms of silver and oxygen and four ions of hydrogen, making four ions of silver and two water molecules. Now we're asked to calculate the standard free energy, or delta G, and also the equilibrium constant for this particular reaction. Here are some reduction potentials of the half cells that make up this overall reaction. Now in order to do this, we need two things. We need first, we need to keep calculate the cell potential. And the second thing we need to know is the number of moles of electrons that are needed because we need those two values in order to accurately calculate uh, delta G and the equilibrium constant for the following half reactions. Now, the first thing we want to do is figure out what the cell potential is. And as you know, it's the bigger minus the smaller. Now I have them kind of in reverse order now. Normally I would have the larger one on top and would subtract the bottom one, but it doesn't always have to be that way. I have 0.123 and I'm going to subtract 0.80. When I take 1.23, subtract 0 0.80, I get 0 0.43 volts. So that is my first number that I need. That's the volts from this electrical cell, or this voltaic cell. The next thing I want to do is figure out how many moles of electrons got transferred in this process. Well, I just have the half reactions here. And what I need to do is figure out the balanced chemical reaction, and then figure out those electrons, the electrons that are lost by one thing and gained by another. Now, if you remember, reduction happens at the cathode, and the larger of the two numbers is the cathode, and the smaller of the two numbers is the anode. And if reduction happens at the cathode, then the reduction half reaction stays as written. That means that the other half reaction needs to turn around. So I've got Ag is equal to Ag plus plus one electron. Now, the other one stays as written. It's O2 plus 4H plus plus four electrons gives me two H2Os. Now I need to balance these half reactions. And the first thing, or the only thing that I need to do, is figure out how many moles of electrons I need to multiply the top one by so that it's the same as the bottom. So I got four moles of electrons in the bottom reaction, only one up here. So I multiply everything by four so that I can eliminate the four electrons. I double check that when I do this that I get the reaction as it's written up on top. So 4Ag plus O2 plus 4H pluses, that's these things right here, gives me 4Ag plus and two waters, that's these things here. And as you can see, the reaction that I wrote is the reaction up above, so I can be double sure that the number of moles of electrons that gets transferred in this particular reaction are four moles of electrons, as you can see right here. So I've identified the cell potential, and I've also identified the number of moles of electrons. Now I can go ahead and solve for delta G. Remember, delta G equals negative NFE. Now before I set up this problem, we need to talk a little bit more about the units so that when it's all said and done, you can see that the units cancel and you get delta G as it's desired. But first, let's go back to volts here. Volts are actually derived from the 
two different units. A volt is a joule per coulomb. Now joule is of energy and coulomb is a measure of charge of electricity. So a joule per coulomb is actually a volt. So that when I actually put it into this formula and I use the cell potential here, I want to use joules and coulombs rather than volts. Otherwise, my units aren't going to cancel out. So let's set up everything here. I've got four moles of electrons times Faraday's constant, which is 96,485 coulombs per mole. Finally, I have 0.43 joules per coulomb. Now, the reason that I explain what, a, what the volt is, is that so that when you look at the units, you can see that everything cancels out. You've got moles canceling moles, you've got coulombs canceling coulombs, and the only thing left is joules, and that's good because delta G is measured in joules or kilojoules. Now, when you multiply this out, you get a very large number. It's a negative 1,000, excuse me, 165,954 joules of energy. But as we know, delta G is measured in kilojoules, so just move the decimal over three to the left, and it makes more sense that it's neg negative 165, we'll call it negative 166 kilojoules of energy, and that's the delta G for this voltaic cell. The last thing we want to do is calculate the equilibrium constant for this reaction. And I'm once again going to use the cell potential in order to do that. Now we just learned that to calculate K, you need E to the E times N times F over RT power. And all I need to do is just plug the numbers in to this formula in order to calculate that. So I'm going to plug everything in. And as you remember, K is a unitless value. And you'll notice that once I put all these numbers in to this exponent, all those units are going to cancel one another out. So E is 0.43 joules per coulomb times 4 moles times 96,485 coulombs per mole. Now that's the top of the fraction. Now underneath it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times the temperature, which is standard, which is 298 Kelvin. Now I plug all that into my calculator, and then I take E to that power, and I get a final answer of 1.23 times 10 to the 29th, which is a very large K. But you'd expect that because the cell potential was larger than 1, and the free energy was much, much smaller than 1. And so these three numbers all make sense. Final answer, 1.23 times 10 to the 29th. Now in years past, the College Board has deemed this particular information not important for the AP test. But in recent years, we have introduced the concept, maybe not quantitatively, but definitely qualitatively, back to the writing of the AP test. We're going to take a look at what happens to a cell in non-standard conditions. In other words, how can you squeeze more juice out of a cell? How can you get a battery to produce more volts, or make it run for longer at least? In order to do this, we need to first understand that there is a formula, but you won't have to use the formula to calculate, but it's called the Nernst equation. You can find this on your formula sheet as well. The formula reads like this. The voltage that's not standard is equal to the standard voltage minus RT over NF times the natural log of Q. Now you might be looking at this formula wondering, what the hell? What am I supposed to do with this? Well, again, we're not supposed to use it to necessarily quantify or calculate anything, but you can use it. And if you look closely, you can basically determine how to improve the performance of a voltaic cell. Focus in on this last term, the RT over NF times natural log of Q. Remember, Q is the reaction quotient, so it's a snapshot in time. It's essentially calculated the same as the equilibrium constant, where you take the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. But we're not at equilibrium. But if we are in a non-standard situation, we want to know what combination of products and reactants would basically maximize an observed electric voltage. Now since we're subtracting this number, if we can somehow get this term on the end 
the RT over NF times natural log of Q to be negative, then we're subtracting a negative. So then what we're doing is we are adding voltage onto the standard. So if our goal is to have a non-standard cell that can produce more volts than the standard cell, then we need this last term, this RT over NF times natural log of Q to be a negative number. If you can somehow get this to be a fraction, or what will result, is a negative number. Because remember, when you take the natural log of a fraction, the answer is a negative number. If you get a negative number, then you are essentially subtracting a negative, or in other words, the non-standard potential becomes more positive than the standard potential. So let's figure out a way to make this fraction negative. Well, all you need to do is have a larger number on the bottom than you do on the top, and then you've got yourself a negative number. Remember, in a standard cell, the concentration of the products and the concentration of the reactants are both one molar. So one over one is one, and anything log of one is always zero. So the observed potential is the same as the standard potential. So if you can reduce the products and increase the reactants to begin the voltaic cell width, so instead of standard where they're one molarity each, you have small products at the beginning and large reactants at the, at the beginning, well then this fraction is going to result in a negative number and then you subtract a negative and you get an observed voltage that is higher than the standard. This right here is how you can make batteries produce more voltage and make them run longer. There's a couple of other things that you can do, but we'll talk about that here in a bit. Now, as batteries run, they're going to consume the reactants and increase the products, and so this Q is going to eventually get to a point where the reactants get small and the products get big, and then that number is going to flip, and eventually you're going to start subtracting a positive number. And when this value at the end, RT over NF times natural log of Q, is large enough where it equals the standard cell potential, well, then the battery runs out. You see, as products increase, reactants decrease, then you're going to get a number that's large enough to subtract from the standard cell potential. When this number gets large enough to be equal to the standard, well then you're subtracting a number from itself and the observed voltage will be zero. And this is why batteries run out over time, because the reactants consume, the products produce. Eventually you get to a point where these two numbers are equal and they subtract to equal zero. So in summary, qualitatively speaking, if you want to increase the observed cell potential of something that's not standard, you basically decrease the products and increase the reactants to begin with to see a boost in the observed electrical potential. If you want a cell to be less than standard, and I don't know why you would, but if you do, then what you need to do is start out with more products than reactants to start at less than the standard. Now let's focus in on how to make the observed cell potential greater than the standard cell potential. Well, that takes care of this video lesson. Thanks for watching.